Okay, then let's start, and I am sure that some more colleagues will join. Uh, first of all, good morning. I'm very pleased to be here today. I heard from my colleagues that yesterday was a very dense and interesting day, and uh, for sure I have missed something, but you never can be everywhere at the same time. I hope that uh, I will catch up during the day of today. Now, this first session today is about ecosystem services and their assessments. The only uh, word ecosystem is uh, relatively new in our EU biodiversity framework. We have uh, started speaking about ecosystem services in our biodiversity strategy. And uh, the big importance of addressing ecosystems and their services is to make them better known to the wider framework, not only to the nature and biodiversity framework. Ecosystem services are services which in the past we have always taken for granted because nature would provide them for free, so to speak. Clean air, fresh, clean water, good soil, these are typical ecosystem services. Now, due to our use, if not abuse, of our environment and of our nature and biodiversity, these ecosystem services cannot be any longer taken for granted. Very often, we have to fight to keep them in good status. So, in in order to understand better how this uh, concept works, we have worked uh, together with all our member states, with all of you, with our environment agency and with the Joint Research Center of the Commission mainly on mapping in the first place our ecosystems and assessing the services they are providing. I am really very proud that at the end of last year, we were on time in meeting uh, the target we had set ourselves that by end 2014, we would be able to map ecosystem services uh, in the EU. And if we are not completely there, we can say that broadly we have achieved this goal already. Now we are moving into the next step, which is valuing our ecosystem services so that the importance they have, not just for our environment, but in the first place, I would say for our health, of all of us, because uh, healthy ecosystem services contribute to better human health. For our economy, wealthy ecosystem services are an important economic factor that we should not underestimate. But in order not to underestimate this value, we need to be able to value them appropriately. And in that respect, we are working inside the Commission <clears throat> with our environment knowledge community, which incorporates, uh, again, the Joint Research Center, the European Environment Agency, our very important uh, DG research and innovation. And I'm quite happy that uh, 
both representatives uh, of the Joint Research Center and of our DG Research and Innovation are uh, here today to present their views. Once we will have worked on this uh, natural capital accounting system, then we will be able to incorporate this dimension, this value provided by ecosystem services into the broader picture. Now, uh, since I was saying already that we should not waste our morning just in speeches because I hope that at the end of this session we will have the possibility for an exchange. Let me move to introducing already Joachim Maas, whom most of you know. Joachim Maas is our man on Mars, as we would say, on mapping and assessment of ecosystem services at the Joint Research Center. I think I can safely say that without your work, Joachim, we would not have been able to reach the target. So over to you now. Yeah, thank you for these kind words. Also, thank you to the Latvian Presidency for uh, having the opportunity here to show you an update on the progress that we made on Action 5 and, and on Mars. But I also um, want to thank the colleagues of DG Environment and, and the Environment Agency, um, in particular on Teller and Marcus Erhard. Maas is really um, a piece of teamwork, and I will demonstrate that also um, during uh, the presentation. Um, Action 5 of the Biodiversity Strategy really sets the knowledge base. It wants uh, member states to, or it asks member states to map and assess their ecosystems and ecosystem services, and then also to assess economic values and, and promote these values in, in, natural, uh, in, in natural capital accounting systems. The working group MAS as such oversees the implementation of Action 5 and it consists of commission services, member states and a number of uh, external experts. MAS is really, or the action as such, is really instrumental, if you want, for a number of other uh, important actions under the biodiversity strategy, in particular actions 6 and 7, uh, which relate to the development of green infrastructure in Europe, to um, restoration and the prioritization of restoration efforts across Europe and to the No Net Loss Initiative. And for these type of actions, we feel there is a need to have good spatial information on ecosystems and ecosystem services. But, but evidently, having a, a knowledge base on ecosystems, biodiversity, condition services will prove to be important as well for other targets, in particular uh, if you want to talk and discuss about sustainable agriculture and forestry. Um, we have not been sitting still with, with the working group, that's the least uh, we can say. Um, immediately after the implementation of uh, or the adoption of the biodiversity strategy, the MAS initiative started. Um, we did so uh, with a workshop uh, inviting all the member states to discuss a set of policy questions which we need to address. And this has ultimately led to the publication of two reports uh, of the working group. Um, a report that sets a number of typologies, the conceptual framework, and another report um, that puts these frameworks uh, into action and into practice. More on, on this later. Last year on the 22nd, uh, there was the mass high level event where commissioners and ministers of, of member states already made a first update on, on, on the progress made on, on the mass activities. And they highly endorsed uh, um, mass. We had, or, or we will have in September the 10th uh, working group meeting, now spread over two days because we realize and we see the enthusiasm uh, of different member states and we, will, we would like to um, have the opportunity for them to, to discuss more in depth and we will do this further in December in a delivery workshop which will be held in Brussels, also spread over two days in the premises of uh, Belspo. 
So note these days already in your agenda. I said earlier that mass is teamwork, and, and we really see this like this, and we experience this like this. There are four key actors, I think, in, in, in the process. Of course, first of all, there's the member states. We see that, that mass has started in most of the member states. Some member states have completed a national scale mapping already, and many member states have uh, available regional case studies which can serve as a basis for further national-based mapping. There are the activities of the working group. Uh, we provided a conceptual model. We provided typologies uh, for ecosystems and for ecosystem services, which member states can use in their assessment. We have provided a common assessment framework, so the building blocks for doing an integrated assessment. And most of all, we put this in the working group in practice uh, through a number of uh, thematic and cross-cutting pilots. I will uh, touch on these um, as well later. Um, there's also the work of the EU institutions, and Ms. Bocella already pointed out that we have now created this uh, environmental knowledge communities. Uh, the, the environment agency is there, the Joint Research Center, um, the colleagues of uh, research and innovation, but an important key actor is missing on the picture is Eurostat, which will also be integrated in further mass activities. And last but not least, we, we are dependent when establishing a knowledge base on the research community in, in, in Europe. Um, and we are happy to say that, that uh, a few months ago, a dedicated coordination and action started called Esmeralda, which will provide support to the member states on mass activities. The, I will, I will go over each of these uh, key actors and demonstrate some of the progress made. Early in 2013, we delivered a conceptual framework for a mass type assessment, and it still guides us uh, for doing um, current and future work in mass, more in particular when it comes to see how, uh, ecosystem, how good ecosystem condition is necessary to provide multiple uh, ecosystem services which result in, in, in human well-being. And also the, the, the box on the right will be unraveled in future work, so the mass project will address or, or will give more importance to um, methods for uh, economic valuation and natural capital accounting. Um, in the second report, we developed, based on a number of uh, pilot studies, this common assessment framework. Uh, which constitute the building blocks for a mass type of assessment at national scale, uh, which, which contains the information and the methods on how to map ecosystems in, in countries, uh, what kind of data, environmental data flows, uh, for instance, collected under different environmental legislation is available to assess their condition, what kind of indicators and data are available to map and assess ecosystem services, and how can we bring this type of information together uh, in a more integrated uh, way to assess our ecosystems. The pilot studies um, um, are, are uh, still uh, very active. Uh, we have reported results on pilots in agriculture, forest, freshwater, and marine, where we have collected a number of indicators and methods for mapping and assessment. There is also available a special report on natural capital accounting, and there are currently two uh, running pilots, one on soil and one on urban ecosystems. The one on urban ecosystems, I'm, I'm leading this one together with the Netherlands as a member state, and we are about to launch, uh, and, and the, the link shows that, a, a survey where we, where we ask member states, cities, and the research community to contribute. We ask them on, on the kind of, of policy that is in place in cities in Europe on urban ecosystems. And we want to know what is the evidence base that cities are using um, to support these policies. This will be launched soon, officially uh, next week, um, uh, at the Green Week. 
Um, the member states have started mapping processes, also member states that were in the beginning of, of uh, the initiative quite skeptical on the need uh, for, for mapping. So here are some examples which are available, but much more work has been done, for instance in Spain, in Flanders, in the Netherlands, um, and so on. Um, this, this information, the spatial data on ecosystems, on ecosystem services, has have, have been used also in a number of national assessments which are available, which either already started under the framework of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, under the framework of TEEP, but lately also under the framework of MAAS, and you will receive uh, some of the examples in the next um, session. These, these particular uh, reports, which are depicted here, they do um, explicitly use spatial information in their assessment. Um, at, at the European level, the, the colleagues of uh, the Environment Agency have provided the first ecosystem map in Europe, which is based on nine types of, of ecosystems, and the information is uh, compiled or is based on land cover and land use information, but then further updated with uh, habitat information, soil information, and so on. This is also available um, for, um, as data for member states. Uh, further work is ongoing on how to assess the condition of these uh, different ecosystem types. This is a map of uh, a proposed map of the condition of agroecosystems on cropland and grassland. And again, uh, we will use different information on nitrogen, uh, Article 17 reporting, and so on, to come up with dedicated indicators to assess condition. The Joint Research Center has prepared uh, a number of uh, maps on, on ecosystem services, which can also be used by member states um, if, if it is needed. And these spatial uh, data, based on modeling, but also based on, on uh, information from Eurostat, has been used in a recent assessment um, on the trends and the status of ecosystem services in Europe over the, the last over the first decade of, of uh, the 21st century. There, the main conclusion is the following. What we see in Europe is, is a, an, an increased productivity of different ecosystems, um, which, which evidently has an impact on a number of ecosystems, and mostly on productive ecosystems, such as forests and cropland, where we see an increase in the ecosystem services that are delivered by these systems. But this often happens at a cost uh, which, is reflect, which can be seen in more vulnerable systems such as grasslands and heatland, where we see a loss, and the loss is often disproportional to, to the size of, of, of these systems. In particular, pollination, habitat quality in grasslands and, and heatland is, is under threat. Um, DG Environment has been, been um, supportive also to the member states through, through uh, uh, service contracts. One is called MESU, that's a three-year contract which is uh, soon about to finish in, in the fall of 2015. And it will provide, it will provide us with a, um, an update on where the member states are uh, on, on the MAAS initiative. Um, also quite interesting was uh, a, uh, the train project where um, the contractor Altera, together with JRC and EEA, we have invited um, do a dozen of, of member states to workshops in order to come, train, learn about how, uh, what, how you can use different kinds of data for mapping ecosystems and how you can use them in their assessments. Um, these, these workshops were quite successful. They were eye-openers, certainly, for the policy uh, delegates that, that they were there because they experienced that mapping and assessment is not an unfeasible thing to do. It's quite feasible, possible, and it helps them in, in prioritizing and in understanding how spatial data on ecosystems can also be used in other policy um, areas, in particular agricultural, uh, regional development, and so on. These activities will uh, be carried further through Esmeralda, um, the new uh, coordination and support action funded by uh, DG Research and Innovation. 
Uh, Benjamin Burkhardt of Kiel University is the coordinator. I'm also involved in the project. We are happy that the consortium almost, uh, almost covers uh, all the, the, the EU member states. There are national contacts in, 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 in the consortium, uh, which you can contact when it comes to issues of, of, of uh, mass. But they will certainly contact you, for instance, uh, to attend the first uh, stakeholder workshop that we will do, where we, where we start from uh, the conclusions of this meeting, and if you want, what is the status and the progress made by the member states on Action 5, and how can the project actually help the member states in carry mass further. The workshop will be held here in Riga uh, in October, and again, you may be contacted to participate. There is budget uh, to have uh, to invite people to the workshop. Some final slides on, on the delivery of mass. Again, I, I uh, restate that there is a workshop planned on delivery uh, end of December to which all member states are invited to come and tell their, their, their uh, stories on mass. Uh, mass products, spatial data on ecosystems and ecosystem services can be delivered uh, through the BIS platform. We see two types of, of deliveries. Um, case studies, uh, which are useful for learning, for understanding what is going on in Europe, for exchanging and so on. So this type of information can be integrated in, in the platform, but also the, the spatial data on ecosystems and ecosystem services. Uh, there is a, a dedicated uh, page um, for establishing an atlas um, on, on this type of information. Final slide, the conclusions and the way forward. I believe that, uh, that Action 5 and MAAS have been instrumental in, in, in boosting and in all the work on, on mapping ecosystem services that is evident uh, from the scientific literature but also from the activities that we see ongoing in, in the member states. We see that, that uh, member states are organizing themselves in working groups and in communities to promote MAAS activities. I was lucky to attend uh, several of these meetings in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Belgium, um, but there is more in other member states. Uh, we will be able to present a more complete picture of where member states are uh, in, in the fall. It's important to stress that uh, mass did not go uh, um, by unnoticed as it comes to uh, IPBES. Uh, soon, uh, the regional IPBES assessments uh, will we'll start, will kick off, and MAAS will certainly be uh, recognized as one of the most advanced regional assessments that can be used for IPBES as well. Um, this year we will see also a shift uh, in, in the focus of the MAAS working group from biophysical mapping to also including um, monetary or economic valuation of ecosystem services and this will be further enhanced and endorsed by dedicated work of different commission services including Eurostat on natural capital accounting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you Joachim for this uh, very good insight into the work on mass and where we stand today. One element worth picking up already is that all the work that all member states have carried out uh, in reporting, uh, in mapping, and in this sector very much also in our Article 12 Birds Directive and Article 17 Habitats Directive reporting exercise, which is and has been perceived as a very cumbersome task, which it, it is indeed for member states and for regional uh, authorities, can now be used in a more consistent way. And the better we provide our basic data, the better then all this basic data can be combined into providing a new 
understanding and uh, new views. We have seen the different maps on one slide where Mars was focusing on different ecosystems. And all of this is possible thanks to the data which you are providing. You are providing to the Commission on the basis of various reporting exercises on nature legislation, but also on water and on air and on other legislation. It is also based on all the reporting which uh, you member state statistical offices are providing to Eurostat, which then allow this uh, more comprehensive overview. I think it, it is useful to recognize that we can have this work which we see today being realized with Mars thanks and only thanks to all this hard data gathering and reporting work which is going on in all member states on a regular basis. And this maybe we, we should also try to communicate more because sometimes just data gathering is a frustrating exercise. But then when you see the results, it is uh, extremely rewarding. So now let me introduce Birgit de Boissezon. Birgit is a senior head of unit in our research and innovation directorate general. She is responsible for sustainable management of natural resources in DG Resources and Innovation, and more specifically in its uh, Natural Capital Directorate. So I, would, I think that I can say that the work carried out by Birgit and her colleagues is really crucial in order to achieve our common endeavor. And once again, this shows that only through joining forces, we will be able to achieve our goal. Now, Birgit, you are presenting us nature-based solution to societal challenges. So thank you very much, Pia. And indeed, I think we need to go hand in hand to actually achieve what needs to be achieved. So, uh, I'll go, uh, I will explain a little bit uh, the new orientations that we are heading at uh, in DD Research and Innovation in terms of uh, uh, biodiversity and ecosystems. And uh, the, as you see, the title is Native Based Solutions, and, and I'd like to uh, explain a little bit what we mean with that and, and how we are going to go about it. So first of all, the, the definition, or rather I would say the working definition of, of nature-based solutions uh, that we are operating with not just now, well knowing that uh, it has to be refined. So we see nature-based solutions as solutions that are inspired and supported by nature, uh, which can simultaneously provide environmental, social and economic benefits uh, to, to our communities and to build in resilience to them. So they are solutions that bring more nature and more diverse nature, I should maybe say, uh, natural features and processes into cities, landscapes and seascapes through systemic interventions that are locally adapted and resource efficient. So for us, this is a way to actually find some responses to some of uh, the major challenges that we face today. So, here we go. Um, what's really important with this uh, concept is the, the idea of, of uh, uh, environmental, social and economic benefits and co-benefits, because we really see it as a systemic response to, to the challenges. And we try here to, to present with this flower and its petals, uh, some of the different uh, benefits and co-benefits, depending on where we put the accent, 
uh, of, of, uh, in the three dimensions of sustainable development, so the environmental, economic and social. So um, you will see among the economic uh, uh, benefits, uh, local and green jobs and growth, which is much very high on, on the uh, Commission's agenda these days and, and in Europe as such, of course. Uh, but you will also see uh, energy efficiency or disaster risk prevention or on the more environmental side, water and soil protection, climate change adaptation, enhancement of natural capital. And then, not to forget, because they very often go together with the environmental benefits, the social benefits, whether they are uh, in terms of health and well-being, uh, social cohesion and integration, or, or simply better places to live and work. Now, what's the, then the link between uh, nature-based solutions and uh, the biodiversity strategy that you are discussing these days? I think uh, we can talk about both direct contributions and indirect contributions from research and innovation and that. And uh, the main point that we are making here is actually on on the target two, on maintaining and restoring ecosystems and their services, in particular through green infrastructure. Uh, for the uh, contribution of agriculture and forestry to maintaining um, and enhancing biodiversity, uh, it's more in the, in the camp of my, my colleagues from uh, working on uh, agriculture and forestry. But I'll, I'll focus mainly on, on the first point. So, green infrastructure and database solutions, again, different, different terminologies uh, coming from, from different uh, uh, perspectives. Now, the green infrastructure is, of course, uh, defined in, in, the, um, uh, in, in the communication from 2013 as a strategically planned network of natural and semi-natural areas with other environmental features designed and managed to deliver a wide range of ecosystem services. So, and I, oh, sorry, I, and I just uh, uh, try to give our uh, definition of nature-based solutions. So we see it as, as uh, I would say, overlapping and, and mutually complementary uh, uh, concepts where uh, we can see the green infrastructure as a, a kind of tested tool for providing economic logical, economic and social benefits, and that uh, we focus more on the more innovative and uh, new, improved tools for uh, having these benefits for the future. So uh, we also have different uh, tools to actually um, promote the one or the other. Uh, and of course, again here, they are complementary rather than exclusive. Huh? So the Life Plus uh, program uh, for green infrastructure at the uh, NCFFF that started, and on, on the research and innovation side, on the future solutions, if you may, uh, the Horizon 2020 with uh, a financing, uh, new financing uh, mechanism, which is called Innofin, but is uh, very similar to the NCFF, actually. So we could say that uh, the, with the green infrastructure, we work with nature. Uh, under nature-based solutions, we innovate with nature. But if we put the two together, we work and innovate with nature for people. Very nicely uh, working hand in hand. Now, coming back to the, um, to the concepts and terminology that uh, Pia mentioned in the, in the beginning. In the past, in, in, in terms of research and innovation, we focused very much on defining the challenges, defining the problems. Uh, we were doing uh, research on biodiversity in, in different uh, ecosystems. We then moved, I would say, to the ecosystems approach that we also mentioned. But we will go further this time round. So we will not just look at the, or define well the, the floods and soil contamination, air pollution, etc., as we can see it here. We would like to actually look at the things from the other end and look at the solutions to the problems. And then, of course, through this uh, mechanism with native solutions, also enhance the natural capital. So we place all this in, in the new context we are in, 
the new Commission priorities with uh, jobs and growth, but also a resilient energy in your, uh, union with uh, uh, climate change policy and EU as a global actor. The new uh, research and innovation framework programme from 14 to 20, Horizon 2020, where for the first time innovation is, is part of, of, uh, of the agenda and very uh, prominently so. Uh, and which actually uh, made us move from this, uh, I would say, biodiversity and ecosystem uh, research to uh, the nature-based solutions. Now, uh, we have been working with this for, in, for the last uh, couple of years to, to prepare uh, the work, uh, and we have made in these couple of years a lot of consultations. We had an expert group uh, with a report that came out here in the beginning of the year. Um, but also uh, uh, three uh, successive uh, uh, presidency events under the Greek, Italian, and today, <laughs> uh, no, last week rather, the, the Latvian uh, presidency uh, to um, uh, focus on different aspects of or different impacts of nature-based solutions. In the Greek uh, presidency event a year ago, it was, uh, the focus was on economic benefits. Uh, in the Italian one in um, November, December 2014, we focused on social benefits. And in the um, conference last week in Ghent, uh, in Belgium, we focused on, uh, social, um, on environmental and health benefits. So I promised to um, report a little bit from what happened at that, uh, at that event. So it was called Nature and Urban Wellbeing native-based solutions to societal challenges. And as you see here, the uh, objectives were to uh, provide a forum for a dialogue across fields of research, policy, and practice. So very many different actors were actually present. Uh, it was to evaluate scientific and social conditions and options for upscaling and, uh, of native-based solutions for health and related issues. And uh, also to build on previous work knowledge and experience to develop innovations in native-based solutions. So I, I've uh, chosen to present the, the outcome of the report, of the conference, uh, according to four challenges that were mentioned in, in the introductory uh, session by Pierre uh, Mikvich from uh, SICA, uh, his research director at SICA in, in Finland. But if, first of all, I would say there was quite a broad uh, support to the whole concept and, and work on native-based solutions, uh, but also uh, some um, considerations and recommendations for future work uh, uh, according to the four challenges indicated here. So the sustainability challenge or the challenge uh, uh, to actually transform uh, from an unsustainable living uh, that we are currently under, uh, the policy challenge, the knowledge challenge, and the uh, challenge for a uh, circular economy. So looking a little bit on, on the, uh, the different suggestions made concerning the sustainability challenge, uh, there was a, actually a discussion on the concept itself. Uh, it was argued that it was well understood and maybe even better understood than many other uh, concepts, but that we still need to refine it to be clear about the criteria for inclusion and exclusion, uh, while still keeping it quite broad. It was uh, also uh, underlined that we need to ensure a proper balance between the socio-economic and environmental benefits from the native-based solutions. Uh, one example given, for example, was that even if there was a greening of a city, for example, uh, it's, it's not sufficient to, to plant a lot of grass or, or have a, a monocultures of this and that. Um, uh, also, it should be considered that uh, invasive alien species uh, could, could look green but uh, would not be uh, successful in, in terms of environmental benefits. In other cases, you might have an overweight of, of, of either the social or the economic part. So a balance is indeed to be sought. And then that uh, any work has to build in the longer-term sustainability aspect for 
those solutions to be uh, successful. On the policy challenge, it was indicated that uh, a a support is needed for such solutions at different levels, so at very local, regional, national and supranational levels, but also among very different actors in, in, in the, in the val various uh, value chains. It's uh, also the, the role of policy to try and speed up and direct the transition uh, through, for example, long-term pl programming or planning and uh, funding also, investments. That could uh, uh, be realized through real scale, real time demonstration projects, uh, living labs or action research as it was also uh, called. Uh, many local authorities, cities are uh, faced with uh, major investments these days to cope with some of the challenges. And what they really need, it was said, and, and which we've seen in other, in other instances of course, is that uh, we really need to provide some evidence of the cost effectiveness of uh, native-based solutions. But also, we have to look at uh, any legal or administrative barriers for implementing uh, uh, native-based solutions. So in some cases, we need to look at uh, the framework there, is a new uh, rules to be set or others to be relaxed uh, in in uh, Germ now in, in the Netherlands, there is uh, this uh, scheme of uh, green deals, which allows to uh, make some relaxation of of, uh, um, uh, of the legal framework uh, to actually uh, ensure that innovation can take place in a in a restricted manner, and to test new solutions. And then there is the whole uh, issue of uh, inclusiveness. Uh, and uh, uh, the fact that we need um, uh, transdisciplinary, uh, one single transdisciplinary network to be established, which is a kind of network of networks. Now, the knowledge challenge, again, a need for solid evidence uh, uh, to be uh, to convince the, the different stakeholders involved, uh, a need for long term monitoring of both processes. Uh, because much of, of uh, uh, the success of uh, nature-based solutions will come through the different processes put in place, uh, and uh, uh, also of, of the changes encountered, uh, whether of environmental, economic, or uh, social uh, nature. Uh, much uh, focus was put on the co-production of knowledge, uh, and of knowledge of a transdisciplinary manner or nature. And again, the involvement of multi-stakeholders and uh, multi-levels. Uh, it was uh, presented, and we saw a lot of examples actually, of contextual and anecdotal uh, knowledge. So a lot of experiences are there, a lot of examples, good examples are there. The problem is to uh, upscale the experiences uh, at local level and, and to replicate uh, across, uh, across the board. Last but not least is the circular economy challenge, how to embrace and manage complexity was the question. Uh, we need systemic solutions that take into account very many uh, factors. Um, and that also uh, implies uh, um, an, an element of co-implementation between the different stakeholders. But we should also uh, highlight the many new possibilities that uh, these solutions will uh, represent for private economic actors uh, so that they can actually choose uh, sustainable options or mix of option options rather than the traditional ones. Um, it's important for uh, this to happen to uh, be able to uh, attract new stakeholders. Uh, so cities, for example, will have play a key role, city authorities, uh, but also the private sector, construction sector, various uh, investors, insurance companies, uh, all kinds of disciplines, uh, architects, uh, landscape architects, etc. And then, not least, it was uh, 
argued that there is a, a big need for new and innovative models for governance, finance and business. So it's not just about finding out about nature-based solutions, but also very much about how they are implemented, how they're used, and, and therefore um, the processes involved. Now, very short, again, a little bit on, on, the, uh, on the terminology. Uh, this is just a picture we like to show to indicate how we see uh, uh, how innovating with nature could actually link the different um, ecosystem types uh, and the, the services and solutions they can bring uh, from on the re left hand side the, the ecosystems and the cultural regulating and supporting uh, uh, provisioning uh, solutions they can bring uh, on the right hand side. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, our main objective is actually to invest in those solutions. So uh, widen up the solutions portfolio to nature-based solutions uh, and uh, uh, as already hinted, uh, uh, foster social innovation as much as technological innovation. So we want to uh, show that it's possible to provide systemic, scalable and integrated nature-based solutions at landscape at city level. But to do so, we need to implement uh, solutions that are co-designed, co-developed and co-implemented. And thereby we can leverage investment from public and private sector and support the uh, solutions uh, towards uh, market through uh, performance indicators, uh, different governance methods or also incentives. Creating a market, creating the supply, but also creating the demand. So, and the means we uh, have at our disposal for implementing them uh, is first of all to establish a dialogue platform for the diverse stakeholders, uh, but also map and network the good examples that actually exist across the board. Uh, and then we'll set up large-scale demonstration projects on effectiveness, applicability and applicability of nature-based solutions. Um, and we will uh, experiment with new types of collaboration between the different, uh, uh, very different stakeholders in the value chain, um, whether they are uh, about new financing models, governance models, uh, uh, business models, etc. And then we will uh, collaborate uh, in, at international scale too on this. So just to, to, to illustrate here the systemic approach we would like to take with very many st different stakeholders on the uh, left-hand side, very different but integrated uh, policies on the right-hand side, and in the middle uh, a, a lot of things going on uh, with uh, living labs, uh, new models, uh, new uh, f funding models, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So in practice, uh, we will uh, launch uh, through the Horizon 2020 uh, funding program uh, for uh, 16 to 17, um, calls for large scale demonstrators uh, on what we call renaturing cities. In the first year, focusing on climate and water resilience and in the second year uh, on urban regeneration and what uh, native-based solutions can bring there. Uh, and also on territorial resilience and uh, hydro meteorological risk reduction in, for the 2016 work program. And um, as I said, we are just starting. So um, we will develop based on the different consultations, based on our expert group and on, on different uh, conferences, um, a, a, a dedicated roadmap on innovating with nature. That would include the four elements uh, indicated here. So uh, the development of a European research and innovation area for nature-based solutions, including the whole uh, research uh, activity and innovation activity, uh, which are, are the foundations of nature-based solutions and new nitrogen solutions, uh, but also provide the evidence for investment effectiveness of nature-based solutions. 
So we need to create this knowledge base on which uh, authorities and companies can actually build their investments. Uh, we would very much, in th this context, uh, like to work in, uh, with uh, colleagues because uh, there is evidence for nature-based solutions in, in different uh, uh, places, uh, in our own Director General, but also indeed environment, in the environment, in the DRC, but also in the uh, European uh, uh, Environment Agency. And then, uh, not least, we would like to promote the, the development, uptake and upscale of marketable nature-based solutions and promote uh, the international cooperation in this field and, and try and orient the international research and innovation agenda also towards these type of solutions. So that was all I, I would like to say today. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Birgit, for giving us uh, this very good overview of uh, how you are working on nature-based solution inside the full directorate in DG Research and Innovation and how you yourself and your team are working and also in giving us some practical examples of nature-based solutions. I, I thought that while you were speaking and at the beginning you were mentioning green infrastructure as an important element, that indeed green infrastructure could be taken as an emblematic example of nature-based solutions. In, in order to prevent and to mitigate uh, the consequences of floods, in the past, we used to build big dikes, which were great infrastructure, which, of course, did fulfill uh, the, the objective, at least to a very large extent. Now, we are moving more and hopefully more and more towards a nature-based green infrastructure way of protecting uh, our territories against floods, which is creating floodplains, which is a typical green infrastructure system because not only it uh, prevents and it mitigates consequences of the floods, but it also creates uh, green biodiversity possibilities, so it contributes to enhancing our biodiversity. It creates a leisure space, leisure possibilities for, for us, and we know that in Europe we are a hugely populated region in the world. We we do not have all that uh, green space uh, for our outside activities. It creates uh, better health ecosystems. So these are typical examples on uh, nature-based solution. And I was extremely happy that at the end of your presentation, you also mentioned what would be the funding possibilities uh, in the upcoming work programs uh, of uh, at least your department, because it is worthwhile spreading this message in order to take up all possibilities which exist to showcase uh, how nature-based solution, how green solution, ecosystem-based solution can do the job very often in a less expensive way and surely in a much healthier way. Now, let me introduce uh, Alberto. I don't think that Alberto requi requires much presentation. I don't know which hat you have now. Are you the chairman of the Habitats Forum or our senior 
Nature WWF policy advisor, but I guess that both heads will fit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pia, for your nice words. I should say that my hat today is WWF. So I'm only representing one organization, which it's all more than enough, I will say. So, well, I have to thank also the presidency for this opportunity to present our experience on payment for ecosystem services. From WWF, we have quite some experience in Europe, in particular in the Danube Carpathian region, and I think that this will be interesting to contribute to this discussion. But before I start, oh, I'm afraid there is a wrong presentation, but there is no problem. I will anyway continue with, uh, I wanted to show actually, and I will just describe it, maybe it's enough. Originally there was a slide here with the word economy, and that was it. Economy and WWF in one corner, which is a little bit strange. Well, our Greek and Cypriot colleagues will probably know the origin of this word, economy. Echo is house, as you know, and nomos is management. Originally, this was the management of the house or the household. And there is a second word which is very, very similar to it, which is ecology. I think that you also know that it's a Greek origin. Echo, again, is house, but this time referred to nature. And logos is knowledge. So if we think in the policy context, which place better to be than between the economy and the ecology? And it's quite interesting, actually. Yesterday we were hearing to Mr. and I have to read the name because it's not so easy for me, Yuris Spiridonov, so I hope that I pronounce it correctly. And he was mentioning this uh, example of uh, the difference between the people working in environment and the people working in energy. He was mentioning, if you remember, the people working in environment are nice, open people, but clueless about the economy. Uh, the people working in energy are instead very fit on economy. I'm sure that they're also open and nice anyway. And uh, this is interesting for me because I, it's really a pity that we cannot see this slide, but that's okay. This slide, I have been using it for some years actually now. And it's uh, interesting that after some years, I'm still using it. Let's say that we are still not there. We need to develop very, very much our knowledge and economy. Um, here instead, what we have is this sentence. We need to know the value of ecosystem services because we cannot manage what is not measured. And there is always this, if you want, danger or difficulty that we do not want to commodify nature, but instead we need some kind of measurement and sometimes some kind of information to help us in our decisions. Uh, I like very much actually this uh, sentence from Oscar Wilde. Wild. Nowadays people know the price of everything but the value of nothing. And uh, this sentence, probably without the nowadays, will be still valid. We still are very far away of knowing the value of things, and in particular of biodiversity. So what are the payments for ecosystem services? Well, quite simple. It's a voluntary transaction, this is important, voluntary, of a well-defined ecosystem service. Here we need to be clear, we have to have a very, very clear definition, which is being bought by one ecosystem service buyer, from an ecosystem service provider. And this happens if and only if the ecosystem service provider secures the provision of the ecosystem service. There is conditionality. So it's a simple cycle. And I think it's good to keep this in mind because uh, finally it's a little bit like market logic. There is something, which is the ecosystem services, which are provided by a provider, and somebody buys this service if this service is provided. Why payment for ecosystem services are relevant? The first thing that normally comes to our mind is, of course, to provide sustainable financing or funding for protected areas and for biodiversity conservation. I wouldn't say it's the crucial one, but it's an important one. This improves also the livelihoods of rural areas, which is, again, quite relevant. It's also a targeted spending of public funds and it helps to raise awareness of the contribution of ecosystem services to economy and to human well-being. We have been running this project that I was mentioning before in this region. This is uh, uh, the Danube Carpathian area. You can see here a number of countries which we have been working on, especially Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, and Ukraine. The project has been finished in December last year, but now we are still following the projects that we have been involved in, but in a much more lower intensity. 
Also because part of the objective of the project was to make it sustainable in the future, so it should be auto running by itself, let's say, this way. So I'm going to describe very briefly three examples, and I will, brought, I will bring here some of the conclusions that we got from these examples. Uh, and I will end with some reflections that hopefully will also help the, dis the discussion that will happen after. The first example is from Romania. It's called Ciocanesti, and again, I hope that I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's a pond, it's a fishing pond. Uh, the, the problem is that the fish, uh, the fishes are being eaten, actually, by a number of high conservation uh, value birds who are feeding on this uh, pond. And actually, the owner is losing up to 70% of his income. So it's not um, something that is, uh, you can say, that is small. Uh, the solution that was provided was very simple. To introduce some payments, awarding the managers of the fish ponds for their efforts to protect the birds. Uh, there was a system, a package of five measures, developed with the different values from 70 to 6,000 euro per hectare per year. And the benefit was clear. We finally managed to protect the 31 protected bird species, improve the water quality, and redu re reduce the, gas, the green gas house uh, gas emissions. Uh, the money was coming from UNEP, uh, GEF, uh, GAF, so it's, uh, it was limited in time. But at the same time, there was a system to, uh, or a project, uh, part of the project was to help the owner to develop a new uh, business perspective uh, related with tourism. The second example is from Bulgaria. It's a Persina, it's called. It's in the north of Bulgaria. It's a huge area, but the pilot was only focusing on 150 hectares. Uh, actually, it's a protected area by different uh, figures. Uh, and it has an, an important uh, rural uh, life. There are three municipalities with approximately 27,000 residents. The problems here were related with the deterioration of the hydrological and the carbon cycles. The solution, again, was, uh, I would say, not complicated, but also not uh, something that was coming quickly. To, it was easy to, to, to find the, the way forward. Um, basically, we improved the water regime of the wetland through harvesting the reed. This was contributing to the local economies and reducing the, green uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. How this happened, uh, there was a, an owner, a, a private entrepreneur that, uh, that uh, had um, the machine and they have the facility, the possibility to, to harvest the reed, which is not something uh, easy to find. And uh, he was offered the possibility to, to harvest this reed, which uh, improved uh, the water cycle, and produce with them some pellets. At the very end, the use of, uh, of these pellets, uh, if it's a substitute of the fossil fuels, it is reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. And the last example, again from Bulgaria, Rusensky Lom. This is in the north of Bulgaria. It's a protected area, a Natura 2000 site, actually. And it has uh, the problem of the unregulated tourism impacting negatively biodiversity and the ecosystems. Here, a private deal between the tourist entrepreneurs from the one side, and on the other side, the directorate of the Rysensky Lom Nature Park created a fund, a conservation fund, managed by a stakeholder board for conservation activities. This way, there was a, the possibility to control the, the visitors, uh, the number of visitors, and, the conservation, and the, some conservation activities for emblematic species could be run for Egyptian vulture, for Crex Crex, for the Sauslick, which is a very nice species that is living there. These are, I hope, I know that this was a little bit quick, but I think it's important to have a little bit of an overview of which are the kind of uh, examples that we can provide from this area. Uh, and we got some conclusions from all this experience. I'm only going to highlight some of them because we have a, actually a full paper full of lessons learned that I think will be interesting probably to share with uh, anybody interested. The first conclusion is about the baseline. And here I think I refer to MICE because the exercise that uh, um, Joachim and the MICE community is doing in, in Europe is 
very, very interesting, and I would say important for the future, not only of payment for ecosystem services, but also for the control then itself of the ecosystem services. So the baseline information was crucial to start. And uh, it was also important to develop the financial framework with support of experts and consulting the national authorities. The starting point was actually to develop uh, alternative future scenarios and assess the future effect of public policies and priorities, tracking what society will lose when certain decisions were taken in terms of investment or development, and evaluating the costs and the benefits when giving priority to one or another ecosystem service at the expense of another. While using ecosystem service information for planning and decision making, again, some lessons learned could be drawn from our experience. I think that there is no question that working with the stakeholders from the start, but in particular when we are building the business case, it provides the necessary ownership and sustainability of the project. Uh, we have to keep in mind that this is mainly, or very importantly, an awareness raising tool uh, for business and for consumers about the value of ecosystem services. Uh, this served as a, a way to broaden the scope of the discussion as an eye-opener, as again, as Joaquin was mentioning before, and to foster the interdisciplinary approach, which again, it's important to make sure that we not only focus on the biological part of it. And integrating this information into economic accounting systems, which is the second part of the Action 5 of the Biodiversity Strategy, is uh, the crucial, or if you want, the ultimate goal that can help also for the future development of uh, uh, valuation of the ecosystem uh, services. And some final remarks, just to, I hope, also contribute for the discussion now. I think it's very, very important to remember that we are speaking about values. This is about the value of nature. I know the intrinsic value of nature is something that is always difficult to defend or to put into uh, the consideration, especially when it comes to accounting, but I think we should not forget all the time that this is the whole idea. We are not making a price tagging exercise. We are not trying to put market, nature in the market. We are not commodifying nature. And as said before, this is useful as an innovative financing tool, but probably this is not the main focus. This is a very, if you want, interesting conclusion or consequence. This is mainly, I would say, an awareness raising tool. Here below you have, uh, anyway, some links to further information on the payment for ecosystem services projects that we have been running and also on our natural capital accounting uh, publication that we developed last year. So we try also to have some collection of the information of everything that exists about natural capital accounting into one uh, publication. I'm sorry that it's very small, but it's, it means that maybe you can have access to the, to the presentation later on. And I don't think I will continue further on. I hope this is helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alberto. I think it was very useful that you coming from one leading NGO, you presented the possibility of uh, payments for ecosystem services. Because indeed, as you put it in your last slide, this is not about paying for nature, but this is about creating win-win solution thanks to nature, especially for local communities. Now I see that we have uh, 15 minutes for a discussion, so I would invite you to, to present comments or to ask questions or to give your views on the three presentations of today. Yes, please, could you very briefly introduce yourself also? Thank you very much. Magnus Wessel from Friend of the Earth, Germany and EB member. Um, the major question which was in my mind during all the presentations was, this is very much based on the benefit for humans. So what about the ecosystems and the ecosystem services which does not have immediate or any ecosystem pos positive things for humans? How do we deal with that? 
Okay. Could we maybe uh, there was another question here in the same row, and then one in the lady behind, white and black stripe, and then we can take an answering round, and then we go on. Um, good morning. My name is uh, Patrick Nuvelstein. I'm from the Netherlands, from a Dutch site managing NGO, and also EEB member. Uh, I had a question for uh, especially uh, Mrs. Uh, Birgit de Basson. Uh, and it's about the multifunctionality of solutions. Um, and I wonder from experiences in the Netherlands that uh, government itself is often the problem because the government isn't um, integrated, build up, it's sectoral. And how do you in your projects give an answer to that? Okay, thank you. Let's take the third question. Thank you. I'm Petruza Moisi from Romania, Eco Counseling Center, and also an EB uh, member organization. Um, a brief comment. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the presenters, all the speakers today, who uh, brought clarity and detailed information about this concept. As I happen to have been among the first ones who were informed about uh, payment for ecosystem services back in 2009, I guess. I've, I don't know whether it was WWF International or European Commission uh, which brought this issue into public attention, but I'm glad that uh, today I, I uh, have a lot more information about the concept. My question is addressed to Mr. Arroyo. As you presented those cases from Bulgaria and Romania, and uh, are you going to expand the uh, exercise to other areas in the Danube River Basin? Um, that's it, thank you. Okay, I suggest we answer this free question and then we take another round. Yes, please. Who wants to start uh, with the first question on ecosystem services? Joachim and Birgit, maybe also. And, well. Okay. Um, I, uh, I want to answer to the first question. I think it's important to stress that the first target of the EU biodiversity, the first and the foremost target is the conservation of habitats and species. Also those ones who don't have an economic value or a benefit, which probably are most of them. I think, I think it's important to, to realize that. Ecosystem services as an argument to protect biodiversity complements conservation. Um, yesterday, we, we have seen figures on the, the, the economic value of the Natura 2000 network. I think it's important to communicate these figures. I don't think it's, it's really necessary, because Natura 2000 is there to protect intrinsic values, values of which people think, or species and habitats of which people think are important to, to, to protect. Um, I, I see the, the application of ecosystem services more in areas where still a lot of work needs to be done. Rural areas, cities, um, agriculture, regional development and so on, where we can speak the language of, of, of investors, of farmers uh, or of uh, other stakeholders. And then lastly, I'm involved in a, in a project uh, funded under the Seventh Framework Program, it's called Be Safe, and it has investigated the arguments which, which uh, we can use to convince different people, different citizens, and different stakeholders on the values of biodiversity. And I was actually lucky to to have a case study on, on Natura 2000 sites, and, and we have been in contact with, with many um, managers of live projects. We have asked them, based on your experience, how do you convince or persuade people for your project, 
to implement it for the value of biodiversity in your Natura 2000 sites? And most of the answers hinted that, intrinsic, that, that insisting on the intrinsic value of nature, of habitats and species is a, remains a very convincing argument for the general public. However, sometimes you need to make your business case. If you want to have stakeholders involved in Natura 2000 sites in, in their management, such as farmers, foresters, uh, recreants, you have to you, you have to use other argumentation and then often ecosystem services is, is, is valid and useful argumentation for those type of stakeholders. So again, I think they complement each other, they do not replace each other, conservation and, and, and ecosystem services. Thank you. Then maybe Birgit, could you so answer? There was one question which was really for you yes. on uh, the research. Yes. And if you want to contribute to answering the other questions uh, also. Yes. Um, yes. First of all, thank you for, for the questions. I think that uh, on the first question, actually, um, talking about benefits for, for the humans. Uh, and, and what if no value? I would say rather, uh, what if uh, no value yet? Because I, we, probably we will we will discover the values later on. Huh? So, so uh, uh, I, I'm not sure we can actually talk about uh, no value for humans of, of anything in nature. Now, coming to the more specific question about um, uh, the multifunctionality and. Um, the issues that could uh, raise when uh, thinking of, about the, the more segmented or fragmented um, governance structures in many cases. And that is indeed why we, we cannot uh, see the development of nature-based solutions, of the systemic solutions, without uh, having at the same time some innovation in, in governance and financing structures. Uh, so, and that is why uh, our choice for, for demonstration projects where, where uh, we would like to see that developed. It, it actually happens. It, it, there are examples of um, uh, authorities that have, at least to the outside, kept, uh, I would say, a multifunctionality uh, uh, entrance. So, for example, to get a permit for a specific uh, nature-based solutions against flooding, for example. Um, there is one entry to the city uh, uh, administration, and it's behind the scenes that the city administration then deals with all the different permits necessary for a specific solution. Uh, but it, it's true, it, it, it does uh, request a, a certain openness to, to actually break down some of the silos in, 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 uh, in, in administrations. Uh, the, the good thing is that we, we have seen that it can actually work, and, and we can just hope that uh, we can induce some movement in, in, in that sense. Um, and that's, yeah, I think that's the best I can do yes. <laughs> on that one. Thank you very much, Alberto. Yes, thank you very much. Mainly for Magnus' question, I will say, I think that obviously as WWF, but also in general NGOs, uh, the main issue is the conservation of the nature. And we are using this as a tool. And it's a very helpful tool in these times when the political agenda is based on jobs and growth, as we were knowing from the Commission now. So I don't think we should lose that side. I think it's actually crucial and NGOs probably should play an important role here. But I also think that joining with the economic part of the discussion is very important for us, not only to be in the political agenda, but also to show that actually this goes beyond something that is beautiful or folkloric or whatever you want to call it. It's something important for human beings because of their own safety or health. So I don't think that is a kind of a contradiction. We need to keep both. And from the NGO side, we for sure need to keep a strong eye that the intrinsic value is all the time there. Actually, the classification that is used for accounting, which is the sizes, is much more if you want to focus exactly on what can be accounted for, while there are other classifications that are including other categories that are more difficult, like supporting or habitats, 
Well, we keep in mind all the time that these kind of categories should be there, probably not so easy to account for them, but should be there. And a number of decisions actually will should be taken um, probably with economic considerations as secondary. And this includes endangered species considerations or my priority habitats, or I would say habitats and species of community interest, etc. And this said, I turn to the lady from Romania. Uh, if we will ex extend our projects in, in Romania, Bulgaria, or in the area about uh, payment for ecosystem services, I know that our colleagues in the Danov Carpathian program are exploring this possibility. I cannot tell you now what will be the outcome, but this is definitely in our radar and it's interesting for us to continue. Thank you. Okay, I, I promised the second round of questions, so the first one was already there. Then. Yeah, uh, good morning, Christa Ratte from the Federal Ministry of Environment in Germany. Um, I found this first discussion round already very interesting, and thanks to you, Akim, for clarifying very, very good the distinction between intrinsic value, which is a value which we don't need to monetize or to, to, to make it fix, because this is really a societal consensus. And we, 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 should, not, we should not try to, 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 to send a message, we, we need to value, to measure the, the, to measure the value of everything before we can protect it. This is not true. We have our laws and, and, and directives um, without measuring the value. So the, to, to, you made it very clear, this, this supplement um, uh, additional argument which might be helpful, but which we don't need um, as an me concerning measures and values. And I, I would like to ask um, two questions uh, to the second and the, the third um, presentation. Um, on the nature-based solutions that was very interesting to see what's going on in the research and scientific area. Um, I was just um, a little bit, um, I didn't know what it's behind, because the, the, the interlinkage to the framework we have on a legal basis, the legal framework, it was touched once, and I read it, maybe not wrong, the legal framework to be relaxed. I just want to know, that was in the, your workshop on Alternet, what does it mean? What, what is the idea behind? Because you know we discuss also the directives in the EU, that there is a legal framework. What is the interlinkage uh, to these concepts? And again, the promotion of marketable solutions. Um, again, my question, I'm economist, I like these words, but in fact, sometimes we should be careful to send messages that sounds like forget the legislation, jump on markets. We have to be careful. And, and that's why I wanted to come back to these issues. What is really behind this? Um, yes, and then on, on, on the payments of ecosystem services and, and the values again, I would, I would think um, we should be very careful with wording. Value and sometimes we think of monetizing values is uh, something very different from compensation payments because of income loss. This is an old concept that was one of the first example. And I would uh, sometimes I, I wonder what, what wording we use. Uh, these compensation payments is very important for nature protection, of course, but it's not a new concept for payments of ecosystem services. It's, it's getting much more complicated we, when we jump to, let's say, really valuing ecosystem services like what does the forest in that and that region deliver for climate change, deliver for water protection, which is not um, where we need different uh, valuing methods. And um, Thank you, Christa. So I, we, I would want to have yeah. two more questions if possible yeah. and then giving the possibility for answers before yeah. we move to coffee Thanks. break. But thank you for asking. There was one over there and then one in front and one behind in a gentleman. Then. Uh, on the Ruskol Baltic Environmental Forum, Latvia. Um, Actually, my question is related also to what lady before was already talking on this 
differences between the compensation and the payment. So, um, so, uh, so Mr. Schnell in his presentation you noted uh, that the, for the, <coughs> the payment for ecosystem services is when there is a, somebody who provides the service and somebody who wants to buy it. So there is this demand. So what with the examples, what you showed actually uh, how this payment could function, it seems it's most cases goes like a compensation for a, for a loss, and in this case, the buyer of, of the service, um, it's more, a, it's like a state or or a public fund who is compensating the loss, and the, um, somehow the awareness of society, uh, how it goes into this, where um, society has no chance to, to decide if they buy this uh, service or not through this. And uh, from other side, if you're looking on this uh, compensation aspect, actually, I think, um, is, is it much different from uh, like a common agriculture policy access to uh, with uh, payments for uh, rural uh, uh, support and uh, agri-environmental schemes? So, Maybe this, this ecosystem service uh, compensation would have to be integrated through this mechanism also. So that's my question. Thank you. And then the gentleman behind there, I think. And this will be the last question for this round. I apologize, but then we can discuss more in depth during the coffee break. Uh, good morning, Fabio Torre, University of Rome, Italy. Uh, one small s short comment and a question. The comment is about uh, a quite important concept that has been pointed out many times uh, today and even yesterday, that is the systemic approach. And I uh, think that we still need to develop the effective methods and procedures to make it fully operational, especially at the institutional level. And I'm very glad to see that there are opportunities, I'm referring to the second presentation, to do this. And based on this, we need to go at the implementation level. So I'm, I'm very uh, um, glad to, to, to see good examples presented uh, uh, for the payment for the ecosystem services. And this is the question. Is there any uh, monitoring system put in place uh, to assess the achievements uh, or eventually even the failures even after the, after the end of the project uh, as, a, as a way to provide a lesson learned to spread among the users. I'm referring to the, to the, third, to the third presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, will we have uh, another round of answers? Who wants to start here? Birgit? Good. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, the systemic approach is, of course, easier to say than to do. Let, let, let's, let's agree on that. But um, uh, I, I try and, and, and re respond to the question with an example. So, uh, of course, we should not uh, give the impression that now forget about legislation and, and we don't need it anymore. But the example. Uh, in the city of Copenhagen, there have been, over the last uh, four years, uh, examples of flooding that have never been seen before. So the, the city of Copenhagen had to do something about it. And even uh, individual citizens and companies wanted to do something about it. So um, you wanted to make measures uh, to actually somehow capture excess water. and. Um, uh, to do so, if you look at a street, uh, if you look at the facade for, for example, uh, creating green facades or, or green roofs, or the bicycle lane or, or the, the, the street in the middle, uh, for all these different bits and pieces of the city, you need to go to different uh, authorities. Uh, so what did they do uh, at the uh, Copenhagen Council? They said, hmm, we can see that that will not work. Nobody would like to, whether it's a, a private person or, 
or uh, a company, they would never uh, be able to go to the different services and, and, and wait for answers uh, all over the place. So they make a, a one-stop entry, uh, ask uh, what, what is the measure you want to put in place, and then we will deal with it. But in particular, we will um, uh, dialogue with the uh, requester to find out what is, what is it really that you want? What are the, really the barriers that you meet? And in many, many cases, it turned out that there were no legal barriers. But it was a question of, of dealing with it or, or actually of communication of, of, of that particular place. So, so there was no need for actual legal change. It was more an administrative organizational change that was, in, that was uh, needed. Uh, and in some cases, uh, in the discussion, the, the, the requester uh, found out that yes, there were indeed uh, security issues or other types of issues that, that uh, made the, the solution impossible, so the person withdraw. But that was in very, very few cases. So the, the basic administrative change was uh, to say yes as a first instance, to, to accept anything, and then discuss, so how does, do we do to make it uh, uh, comply with the different regulations? Uh, in other cases, um, uh, imp implementation of a solution uh, may be difficult because of lack of legislation, actually, not just because there are too many or too constraining, but because there is a lack, because there is no, uh, a company would not invest uh, uh, for a long time with, without a certain uh, uh, clear framework. So uh, that, that's more the, the, the issue, it, very much linked to, to communication, actually, but uh, what is perceived as legal barriers uh, may not be so, or can be, in any other cases, the, the, the council could actually relax a certain, uh, um, a certain rule to experiment in a limited area. Uh, and that's another way of, of, of dealing with it. Um, but it, in the end, it, it turns down to uh, actually uh, working in a very transdisciplinary way, whether in terms of legal, administrative, uh, organizational, and also the financing issue uh, is linked to that. Uh, and that's why we really want to integrate these uh, elements in uh, testing the native solutions, because otherwise we know that uh, they may not be sustainable. Okay, thank you, Birgit. Who wants to answer more? Alberto, and then. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, the first issue about the intrinsic value of uh, Krista, well, I cannot agree more. If I was unclear with my wording, it's, uh, it's uh, apologies, but obviously that's, that's the idea. I think that we don't have any question about what is the uh, overall goal here, is protection of biodiversity, and this is, this is a tool. So if it helps, great, and otherwise we should think in another way. In terms of the compensation that was mentioned actually also by the lady uh, over there, um, the first example is, uh, is probably a, um, an example that can be, I mean, if you want, you can try to find financial solutions for it from other sources. I would say, yes, that's, that's right. Uh, still, it was not possible. So this was for us a good way forward to find a solution for this fishing pond. And in terms of the way to communicate this to society, well, this is, if you want, mainly a way to communicate it to stakeholders involved in that area. So, it was a clear process for the people who were involved in the, in the discussion, especially for the people from the owner from the pond, that there was a value there that could be uh, paid by public funds. And this is again bringing me to, to what uh, I also mentioned as a, one of the conclusions. Uh, the targeted use of public funds is one of the ideas of this, uh, of this kind of projects, that we can use finally public funds for public goods. And public goods may be simply, like the first example, a compensation, or mainly a compensation. For the rest of the examples, I would say that it's, uh, well, I have only shown these three, but I would say that it's a little bit different from compensation. The, the third one is a, a trust fund, basically a, a fund that is served and is uh, managed by the stakeholders uh, board. And uh, basically, part of the benefits of private enterprise is used for conservation. So it's much more clear if you want a payment for ecosystem service. 
Um, I hope I'm at least addressing more or less the question. And uh, the last question about the lessons learned from uh, our Italian colleague. Uh, you can find all this information in the website that uh, I was mentioning before. Uh, in terms of promotion beyond that, well, I am here. And uh, sometimes we, whenever we are uh, asked to speak about payment for ecosystem services, we use these uh, lessons. Actually, what I have shown here is a very short part of what we understood uh, that we learned from all this process. It was, I would, I would say, actually quite interesting, so I would suggest you to read it in detail. Thank you. Okay. Joachim, do yeah, you I want to contribute? Just one final comment because I, b based on, on the questions, I, you notice that the, the issue of putting a value on biodiversity uh, and implementing different pest schemes is very sensitive. Um, to, to sometimes I'm surprised by this because this is the type of practice that we also do if we, if we buy insurances or if we value our lives, our family and so on and then uh, this, this, this seems to be common practice, while if we apply this on nature, then, then it gets uh, very sensitive, which is good in some way because it demonstrates that there is a very high intrinsic value on biodiversity. But I would also like to call that, we, that the conser conservation community should not be self-destructive in, 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 on, on this topic. And I fully agree with Alberto that we must learn from the lessons where it works and where it does not work and continue on, on that approach. Yeah. Well, thank you. Let me pick up uh, on uh, what Joachim has just said on valuing biodiversity and why should we establish a value and why should we pay for ecosystem services. Uh, in the end, the examples presented by Alberto on various payments for ecosystem services were very enlightening because there were possibilities for establishing a, a trust fund. So a trust fund by definition is not only public money for public goods and in other cases it was compensating for the loss of income. Now, when we discuss compensating for the loss of income, this was mainly the first project presented, we are thinking in the first place about public money because who else would compensate for the loss of income? And we will have more possibilities for discussing financing, agriculture financing. I think we have a dedicated session this afternoon and I will want also to intervene there. But what I want just to say at the end of this morning session is that we should not shy away from establishing the, the value of the ecosystem of the services our ecosystems provide. And we should not shy away because I am not sure that we can take it for granted that society will be available for paying whenever, whatever for our ecosystem services. And I, I just witnessed that in our public systems, in our administrations, our own nature conservation administration is in most cases shrinking. I, I don't have many examples in mind of member states where member states' nature conservation administration is expanding, is uh, doubling year after year in terms of human and financial resources. So let's be very honest about it. We will not be able to claim all these payments from our public system. And if we want to compensate, we have means. I 
I think that very often we don't use all the means we have at our disposal in the best way. And I come back to CAP in the afternoon. The agriculture payments were mentioned in the last question already. But we cannot expect that nature is conserved, is compensated, is paid for by itself, by our society. I just want to close with a very practical example which our statistical office provides us uh, on, uh, I think, three monthly basis with. We all claim that we prefer biofood, biovegetables, but our statistical office tells us that we are not buying biofood and biovegetables, that we are simply buying the cheapest food, the cheapest vegetable on the market, which very often are not the bio ones. So let's also take this into the picture for the next session. And let's conclude by thanking once again, not only speakers, but they have really animated this session.